Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Different I Am show. My name is Karuna Patel, and I'm your host today. Today, I have the pleasure of having Armando Cruz in Miami, Florida. He is the owner of Cruz Country Fitness and Physical Therapy. He is a father, a husband, and an author, and much more. Welcome, Armando Cruz. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Let's get the audience to get to know you a little bit. Tell me something that you love to do. Run. <laughs> I like to run and I like to run far. Uh, the further, the better. If I can explore nature in the process, that's even better. So my idea of a good run is running through earlier morning, like at three in the morning, running through the trails, just being by myself with the moon, the trails, and just kind of feeling the earth as I run in the quiet of the morning. <laughs> yes. I remember we were in Thailand one time and you were like, I'm going for a run. And I'm like, it's five. Where are you going? And you're like up there. And I was like, what? <laughs> and you had a great time. So what does that do for you when you, do, I mean, you described it in very intimate details. Like how, what does running do for you? Running is my is my way of of de-stressing, is my way of thinking, is my way of uh, really exploring. I, I like to say nature because I, I that's where I like to run. I like to run in the trails. I like to run. I, I'm not a big fan of running on the road. I'll do it. You know, it's, I, I'll still get in a run because it keeps me sane. And, you know, I don't really run with music or anything like that. It's like a, just the rhythm of the breathing, the the percussion of the of the footsteps just kind of puts me into a zone. It's kind of uh, my, it becomes like a mantra, like the, 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 the rhythm of it. And then it kind of sets me into the zone and I start working out my life problems or whatever needs to happen in the day. And, you know, if I'm holding on to anything, just try to let it go. And so that I can, I can be a, <laughs> a normal human when I return. <laughs> It's really cool that you shared that no one has ever shared their running experience like that to me I've always thought of running as like fitness and like I'm gonna go a couple of miles and I'm gonna go up this mountain so that's really cool that you shared that other side of running that can be possible right yeah right. so so uh, let's talk about a little bit about your lifestyle physical therapist. So will you share about your journey of where you started? You graduated in 2005, I believe, and then correct. And then you, what led you your journey to opening your own practice? I it's interesting because you know I had worked as a personal trainer, athletic trainer for for a while. Um, and then I went back to school, got my physical therapy uh, license, and I quickly realized I started, I started working at a place that I liked very much. Uh, and I say I lasted three months because I liked it so much. But the truth was, I had just gotten married, and I wanted to spend more time with my wife. So, you know, I would be getting home at 730 at night, and I'm like, man, for... If I just got two more personal training clients, I could cover the cost of or the the same amount that I was making at the per, at, at the physical therapy studio. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I'm learning there, but there's a point where I was like, okay, I'm not learning that much, and you know, it was a little bit different model than what I had envisioned. And I, I said, you know what, I, like this is the time. Like I would rather spend more time with my wife and create my own schedule than kind of be behind somebody else. And, you know, that I, I think a lot of that stems from watching the dynamic between my, my father and my mother. My mom mm -hmm. has always worked for uh, a company. Mm -hmm. And it was like, any time that she had to go somewhere, she had to like ask for permission for everything. Um, and she worked hard. I mean, she worked a lot of hours. And then my dad had his own construction company and he worked hard as well, but mm -hmm. If there was a game, if there was a practice, if, you know, we were going to go on a trip with the school and, you know, the, the cross country team is like, Hey, we're going to go for a week here and train. Yeah. He could, he would take off and he would go with us and he would be a part of it. And I knew early on, it's like, I want to be the type of father that my father was to me, to my kids. I have three kids. And so I wanted that flexibility. And I realized that I, 
I, I like that independence where, you know, if things are going great, wonderful, you know, congrats. If things are going bad, hey, look at you because you're the only one here that's making things happen or not happen, right? So yeah. I like that, that, uh, that accountability and that responsibility that I would prefer have it on myself so that if, hey, if I want to do better, I have the opportunity to grow and do better and nobody can is going to tell me, Hey, no, you, you can, you can only make this amount of money, or you can only, you can work only these days. And in this fashion, I kind of like doing my own thing. So. <laughs> yes. The freedom was, you had uh, seen the advantage of freedom uh, early on through your father and not of a lack of freedom, maybe through your mother. So you got both sides and right. so, um, yeah, freedom is a great driver for business owners. I think most people want freedom is, is what they're envisioning to spend more time with family or do more things they love. Um, and like you said, some sort of independence. So um, that's cool that you got that. You were, you had already had that taste before you became a physical therapist and Correct. with your own profession, you know, so um yeah, that's cool. And then you touched upon uh, a different style of physical therapy um, that you, or, or a more broader scope. Will you share about that? Because you have a very unique, I'm not even going to call it a bit, bit practice, a, yeah. a business. So uh, you have something that is called Seven Health. And would you talk about that? Yeah, my wife and I, so my wife is an exercise physiologist and physical therapist, athletic trainer myself. Um, so she is like, <laughs> she is the one that helps uh, organize because, you know, I'm a creative, um, like give me a blank canvas and I'm happy. Give her a blank canvas, not like for her, not that, like it, it makes her freeze, but show her something you've done and she can, she, she helps make it better. She amplifies it. Like her gift is, drawing out if there's something off like when I wrote my book she was my editor and there were lots of things she had a lot of work to do <laughs> she, <laughs> she worked hard as an editor and the book wouldn't have been as successful or as uh fluid to read had it not been for her mm -hmm. so um my wife and I realized that we didn't want to do any everything we started realizing hey what are what are our gifts? Like, where do we create miracles for people? And, and, I, and I say this very intentionally because it felt like that in many instances. You know, we have clients that would come in. They've been to doctors. They've been to acupuncturists, chiropractors. They've seen and done a lot of things, but they're still in pain. So we realized that those people that still have this chronic pain have seen all, all these other doctors. And, and again, still have that pain. Those are the people that we can, we can create miracles with because over the years, we've invested a lot in ourselves to try and learn more about the body, about pain, about how to get better, better results. And then we created our own little system to help do that in a more effective way and in a way that most people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. What are so, the seven health that you sure. So let, let, let's let's go in there. Yeah. You know, most people since since our main thing is chronic chronic pain, most people think of pain and they approach it like if you're a mechanic. It's like, oh, here's this physical thing, and we swap it out for this, or like you got to do these exercises and that's it. You know what? Sometimes it works, but very often it doesn't. It comes back. And so we realized that's not the kind of work that we wanted to do. And we started saying, okay, well, you know, what affects us? And so we came up with these seven health, the emotional health. We have, um, you have your spiritual health, your physical health. We have your relational health, financial health, environmental health. And then finally, what I call your adventure health. So those seven health help to create uh, a more holistic, a more integrated approach to seeing the person and not just thinking of them as a, as a machine, which again, 
a lot of physical therapy has become, it hurts here, let me rub it. It hurts here, let me ice it. And yeah. not looking at, okay, well, but wait, wait let, let's really look at what's going on. What else is going on in your life? What else is going in here? What else? There's just so many different avenues yes. uh, that, that go into that. And each, each one of those things, whether it's emotional or physical, I mean, the physical could be, okay, how are you moving? Uh, what are you eating? What are you drinking? You know, there's some physical components mm -hmm. that we need to address. Yeah. And yes, is there soft tissue work? Are there extra stuff? Yeah. That's not where we start. We got to go from hierarchy, the thing that controls the brain, and then work down from there. Mm -hmm. And when it's time to use that tool, then we use the tool, but yeah. it's not the treatment. Like a lot of times you'll see people are like, oh, you know, oh, the, the Graston technique. Yeah, okay, that's a tool. That's that's not how you fix it. You know, yeah, uh, I laugh because that I get asked about that technique so much, and I'm like, you know, all the techniques are just a glorified trademark physical therapy technique. Like it's just one thing, you know. It's it's so that's why I'm laughing about it. Yeah. So um, yeah, we we know so much more about how much the body is interconnected. Now that, um, I, you know, I really agree with how you're saying, you know, you just yeah. can't focus on one thing like a mechanic, you know, um, but I am more interested in hearing about, if you will, give me a little bit about like how I didn't even think that physical when you were talking about that meant the water and the food and all of that. So if you will just give the audience a little bit a few sentences about what each category is about because it may not be obvious to some people sure i definitely want to share that so it, emotional we're looking at you, the way i like to put it uh, the way i like to say it is like if you held out a pen if you if you have a pen i think we could both agree that it's not a heavy thing you know a pen is pretty light you use it like that but if i asked you to hold that pen out in front of you and just hold it there you know after about a few minutes your arm is going to start throbbing. It's going to start hurting. If you keep it there for longer and longer, it's going to really start hurting. Well, it's not the weight. It's how long you're holding on to it. And so the emotional is really like diving into, hey, what are those little things that you're holding on to that continue to burden you? What are those big things, right? Like it's easier to think of those big things. Oh, somebody died, getting a divorce. I, you know, I'm bankrupt. Like, yeah, most people can remember those, but they they kind of put out all these other little things that start adding up. And so the emotional is really about, hey, do you have, a, do, you, do you know any ways to empty out that burden, put down the bag? Like that's one of the, one of the conversations I, I tend to have at the beginning when I'm talking about burdens. It's like, okay, look, we all have this backpack that we constantly have and we're constantly putting these burdens, these stresses, these little things, these big things in there. And what I want you to do is when you work, when you walk in here, I want you to just take that bag off and we put it there. Mm -hmm. After we're done, if you still see like you want to carry all those things around with you, pick it up and go. If you want to leave some here, that's fine. We have a lost and found. You could always come back and get it. You know, so, I, you know, I joke with them in that way. And uh, so that's the emotional. Then you have the spiritual. You know, I, I, I think it's very, very important when our life doesn't revolve around ourselves. And when we think about the spiritual, it's like, hey, how are we connected to something greater than ourselves? This doesn't have to be religious. Like for some people it, it is, but for some people that they're not, that's fine. You can still understand that, hey, there's something greater than myself. And it's tapping into that. Like, is there a misalignment there? Are you operating in a way where like that connection is blocked, mm -hmm. where you, you can only see you in that and that I, I think it becomes problematic at least in my experience so it's helping them open their eyes to saying okay wait how can how can I open myself up for something greater a greater purpose a greater cause but not that everything goes back to me because then we kind of constrict and that's what we're trying to open up there mm -hmm. and then you have uh the physical we talked about briefly you know hey what's going on with your breathing what's going on with your movement are you resting and recovering? Are you, are, what are you eating? These are, are really integral parts of the whole physical health 
that often doesn't get most people just think of hey are you moving like are you exercising are you doing that's part of it but it's not the same thing and i and i like to make the distinction that all exercise is movement but not all movement is exercise you know exercise usually has a connotation of getting stronger just improving mm -hmm. your fitness whereas movement there's some movement that is designed more for flexibility and there's some movement that is designed to heal and to just release and so teaching and educating them about that yeah. then we have relational we are mammals we are not designed to be by ourselves mm -hmm. and so as such we have relationships with other people and at the core i find that the thing that matters most is the people we love their family uh, our spouse you know that core nucleus if we can get clear on that one the other stuff you have a little bit more wiggle room. But then add on top of that, if things are going a little shaky there, what happens at work? How are the relationships with you and your boss or you and your coworkers? How, how does that, that, that ripple continue to grow outwards? Mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. how does the outward going in affect you? And so getting that, that kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. Then we have environmental. Environmental is, hey, look, you live in your house. That's where you sleep. That's where you eat. Do, when you walk in there, what do you feel? Um, I'll give you an example. Like we, we've been living in our house here for 14 years, 14 mm -hmm. years. Um, when we got here, we came from a little, little hole. Like our, our, our apartment was a one, one. It was like super, super small. We barely had anything. We came in here. Wow. This is a, this is a, a three, two. And it was like, wow. There's so much space. Like we had, like we had our master bedroom, and then all the other bedrooms it was like empty. We didn't have kids at the time. Wow, do we think we were ever going to fill this up? Yeah. You know, because it was like we don't even have enough stuff to uh -huh. to put in places, right? And then, you know, we we painted the house, we did all this stuff, and I remember Christian, my wife, tells me she's like, maybe like of seven years ago, she's like, man, like. I hate the color in our room. I hate the color in our room. It doesn't bring me peace. And like that. After seven years, we finally got the room painted. We took down, so we redecorated the whole room. It didn't cost a lot. You know, we got some people and there's still more that we would like to do, but just that, just repainting it, yes. opening up the, the, the blinds completely changed the feeling. Now it's like, oh, like I'm in my room. Whereas before I was like, oh crap, I'm in my room. Like yeah. it didn't feel the same. Yeah. So your environment plays a big role. If at work, you feel like your desk, your cubicle, your office, your workplace is toxic, like you're not going to operate at your best. Sometimes you can make changes, but sometimes you can't. And so you have to make a decision. Is this something where I can shift my mind so it doesn't feel toxic? Mm -hmm. Or do I actually need to remove myself from here? Mm -hmm. And so having conversations and getting the awareness of, hey, what are our main environments? Our main environments are work, the home, the car, you know, is your car clean? Is your car uh, dependable? Like every time you get in the car, like, are you worried that it's going to break down? That, that brings a new level of stress, mm -hmm. right? So the environment is a, a really, a really important part. Financial, I mean, Hey, are you growing in your finances? Are you able to, to, to provide? Are you saving? Like, do, do you have a future in mind with your wealth or with your, with your finances? You know, are you looking at educating yourself about, hey, how do I save? How do I get rid of debt? How do I, you know, what's good? What's bad? How do I look at money? What's my relationship with money? Mm -hmm. all those things are really important when you're looking at the financial mm -hmm. because look the number one the number one cause of of uh marital discomfort mm -hmm. and and frustration is financial mm -hmm. and maybe you say well i'm not married but you know what it will affect the way you deal with people and the way you see like if you're struggling paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. to, to to make the ends meet Anytime a, a new bill comes through the, through the door, like it's a new, it's literally a load on your, how am I going to pay that? Right. How am I going to pay that? Right. And then the final one is adventure. And adventure I find 
really interesting because most people just do the same thing. Like they're, they're on autopilot. Uh-huh. What adventure allows you to do is to look around the corner and explore and to, to put yourself in unfamiliar environments on purpose, because mm-hmm. what that's going to do is going to help you grow. It's going to, it's going to instigate a, like a chain reaction of, Hey, am I ready for the uncertainty? Mm-hmm. And if not, what do I need to do? Yeah, I like to camp. I like to go in the wilderness. To me, that's that's very healing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I go somewhere where I've been. Other times I put myself in positions where I've never tried or they make me uncomfortable. I'll give you an example. I have never done this before. And one day I, w- I was, I, I run some retreats and I would take men out into the wild and stuff like that. So I was uh, doing some reconnaissance in this this place where I wanted to take a group of men. And I said, you know, I'm going to do this a little bit different. I got a little backpack Mm -hmm. and I just put what I was going to sleep in. I checked it wasn't going to rain. So I didn't bring anything, anything except what I was going to sleep in. And that's it. And then, you know, whatever, some food. Yeah. And this is, again, I'm in Miami. This was in September, which we still have, we have a lot of mosquitoes. And I found out the hard way, it got so bad at night because I was out in the open. Like there was nothing sheltering me. Yeah. It got to a point where I was about to call the ranger because uh-huh. it was pitch black out there in the middle of nowhere. And they, you know, I got the map to the place and on the back of the map, it has the, the number to the ranger. And I was like, I can't stand this. I'm like, nah, you know what? You signed up for this. Suck it up. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, you try to make do. And I will tell you, it was one of the most horrible experiences, <laughs> but it's an experience that I go back to and say, oh, I did that. Mm-hmm. I survived. These are kind of the tricks I had to play in order to survive that. Now, obviously this isn't going to be like if you go on a vacation and you feel well rest and you feel amazing. No, if that's what you need right now, because your body is so wound up, then yeah, don't put yourself in a deeper ditch right but you have to understand how this goes and so that the point of adventure is 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 growth so that could also look like education Mm -hmm. have you signed up for something have you learned something new i took on trying to trying to learn how to play guitar and i said trying because i'm still trying Mm -hmm. you know i i've taken on different challenges on a on a yearly basis where Mm -hmm. i like the idea of Instead of like a 30 day, it's like, no, I'm going to commit to a year to doing this. Mm -hmm. And I try to make it small enough that I can do it even on my worst day. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's drawing something every single day, and right now I'm drawing a bear for 365 days. So I will draw different types of bears in different ways, right? Uh, 365 types of bears. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and, it, and it forces me to, to grow when I don't want to do it. It's like, oh, and I remember the first time I drew the bear, mm-hmm. it was hard. I had to look at something. And then it's like, for the first week, it was like, man, what the heck? I can't, I'm not getting the shapes right. And I'm going like that. I'm already 106 days in. And sometimes I'll look at a picture. Yes. And I'm like, okay, I, I have the shapes in my mind. I can do that. But even when I don't, like now there's been a certain muscle memory and I can, when I don't really want to work it, uh-huh. you know, there's sometimes that are more intricate than others and sometimes not like, but the point is, is you put pen to paper every day and there's sometimes it just flows. And other times you fight with the pen and the paper the entire time. And it's like, yes. okay, great. That's why I'm doing it. Yeah. Not because I'm such an amazing artist, which I'm not, um, but it's because I'm not an amazing artist and I have to put in the reps to overcome this resistance. So again, <laughs> that was a little longer than probably expected, but that those are the yeah. seven healths in a package. One, a couple of things. Um, one of the things I admire about you is you, when you commit, man, you are drawing 365 bears, no matter what, like you, yeah. a couple of things you, you're always constantly uh, trying new things and we, we could touch back on that later. Um, things like this. So I really admire that about you. You pick something and it's not always about enjoyability. It's about 
flexing that muscle and making it, you know, stronger and stronger. And it's always something that I'm not gonna say it's always, but many times it's always something different that you're trying, like the bears, you've done haikus every day, things like that. So I really admire that about you. Um, and then what I want to ask you is, because I see a theme in everything that you talked about right now, one is, why do you think growth is so important? What's the value? Like, yeah, will you share what your perspective is on that? It's a good question. Like, so are we asking, so yeah, you have to kind of break that down and say, okay, wait, is growth necessary to survive? No, you can stay doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm not here to survive. I'm here to thrive. I want to squeeze every last ounce of life. I want to, I want at the end of my life, I want to know that, Hey, I reached my potential and beyond, or at the very least I tried, I fought valiantly as uh, the Theodore Roosevelt, the man in the arena that says, you know, you fought valiantly, um, towards it. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I fought and I, and I failed, I don't care. That's fine. But I was willing to put up the fight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel like that's one of the best ways that I could teach my kids is that it's okay if you fail. It's okay if you suck. <laughs> uh -huh. But if you keep doing it, I guarantee you're going to get better at it. It may not mean you're going to be a professional. Yes. But it will mean that you will get better. Yeah. And if you're willing to put in the sweat equity, mm -hmm. it, you can create some really amazing things. Mm -hmm. and so is growth necessary no it is not necessary to survive but if you don't want to just survive and you want to thrive in life it is essential for you to continue to evolve yeah. i also want to make i also want to make this point you st like you mentioned hey i see you do all these new things and all this stuff christian does not do that my wife but we're wired different. And so growth looks different. So I don't want somebody listening to this thinking like, oh, you always got to be trying something new. I love starting things. I'm an easy starter. That's why I said, give me the blank canvas. Yeah. I don't always finish everything. Now, if I commit to doing something, usually some kind of habit, I make it small enough and I give myself a year or something like that where I say, okay, hey, I want to, I want to explore this or play with this for a year. And then if at the end of the year, I can make a decision to stop, but I want to. And I like, I like the year because the year forces you to get uncomfortable and you're going to find those days where you're tired, that you don't want to, that you screwed up and you took way too long. And now it's like, you're still awake at, at midnight and you're like, crap, I still haven't done my video for the day. And it's like, okay, what am I going to make a video at freaking midnight? And do I, you know, am I going to send it to someone? Am I going to just post it or am I just going to keep it to myself? Am I, and I've done all of the above, but like, that's one of my habits. That's one of my habits that I do on a daily bit. I make one video at least every single day. I've been doing it for, uh, at this point, a close to four years straight wow. without missing a day. I've written, I write every single day, at least 50 words where I'm committed to writing in a post, in a, like in a journal, at least 50 words, right? Wow. So I have these things that I want to improve on mm -hmm. that I have deemed worthy enough to make them a habit. Mm -hmm. My wife doesn't operate that way. Mm -hmm. She needs one thing, two things, I got a million things. I literally have a lot of things. My list yes. is long, but I love it. I love it. Yes. But that's, that's what engages me. We operate very different. And yes. so if, you've, if you're not that person that's a, a quick starter and loves the idea of a blank canvas, not necessarily because you have to paint, but I'm saying the, the visual of, hey, starting something from you is that yes. difficult, then don't be afraid to start things. Yes. But at the same token, be willing to explore what growth looks like for you. Absolutely. Right. You know, because we're all different indiv individuals and there's so many ways to grow and evolve and explore. Yeah. You could read a book, you could watch videos, you could do practices like you're doing, you know, 
And so it's really, I think that's a great point is to really explore and find the way you love to do it so that it becomes a lifelong lovable thing that you're doing to, and you're thriving because you love it. Well, in some fashion, like you said, you know, so. Right. Um, and then what I wanted to ask you was your seven healths approach is so fascinating. It's so what I would call leading edge because it's looking at the entire totality of what makes up the human being, right? Um, was it a struggle to get there? It's not your typical practice and it's not your typical PT kind of thing. And so how was the journey getting there? Did you just have it and it just popped or like share about that, and especially the struggles part, because I feel like people who are doing different things, um, it would help them to hear that if, you know, what struggles we all go through until the fruit comes. <laughs> yeah. Do I struggle? Yes. And still do I struggle? Yes. Uh, le let me just kind of share a little bit of, of the, of the journey for a second. Yes. This didn't just happen overnight. Uh, like I said, I've, I've been practicing for now 16 years. Okay. So I feel like I, I've over the past, I would say the first 13, like I, 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 I did many things, but it wasn't until maybe three or four years ago where I'm like, hmm, no, I, I, we need to make this adjustment. We need to like, this is the angle that we need to, to have the conversations. The seven healths really evolved after that. Cause we started looking at, okay, well, like why, why do we get better results than all the other things that they've tried. Okay, well, let's look at that product. This is where Christian mm -hmm. and her systematizing and ordering things really helps because, you know, my mind works like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen like a mind map where you start with a circle and then like there's a bubble here and another one there goes like, that's that's how my mind goes. And sometimes I communicate like that. And she's like, you can't, you can't communicate like that. Like uh -huh. nobody's gonna be able to follow anything. Yeah. So she thinks more systematic, which is helpful when you teach. And she's a phenomenal teacher. Uh -huh. So I am like, okay. Like so both of you together, you shared ideas yeah. and then bounced back and you cr created the system. And also from your personal training side, um, you had shared that you didn't just believe in this, like get thin body weight loss, like one style of health. Will you share about that? And how that kind of led you even in PT to go, well, maybe I'm, I'm assuming it led you to go, let me, you yeah. had a bigger philosophy on health than what you were seeing. Yeah. I, I've never, I've, I, I realized early on when I did uh, physical uh, personal training that my love or my genius wasn't in getting somebody to be six pack abs or skinny most of the people that came to me already had issues. They had pain. And what I would help them do is I would give them the freedom. I would take off the, the shackles of them not being able to move and do the things that they love because I, I could help them understand their body as a whole. And then as, as I've grown as a physical therapist and as a coach and as a like continue to evolve, I've realized I can go deeper. I can go further. You know, the more I kind of focus on the thing that that drives everything, which is the brain, and then work out from there. Because mm -hmm. I have those tools, but a tool used at the wrong time or for the wrong job doesn't really help you. It's mm -hmm. understanding how it all fall, falls into place. And so um, I realized that I, you know, weight loss wasn't my thing. And we realized that, hey, we have something special regarding people with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, going back to my wife, Christian, she, she naturally is systematic. And so she has an approach. Like if we both saw the same person, it would still look very different. I'm very intuitive. And so what she did really well was say, okay, look, I know how I do it. I have my system, but tell me how you do it. And then I'm like, I don't know. I just kind of feel it. I know it. And yeah. she's like, no, no, no. And then, you know, 
She took the time to draw it out. And it's like, okay, this is what you're doing. This is how you're thinking about it. I was like, oh yeah. You know, I didn't like, I, I couldn't verbalize it yes. until she drew it out. Right. Like that's the, that's, that's so what a good coach does. Yes. Right. It's so innate. I feel a lot of healers, whether they're physical therapists or any acupuncturists or, you know, some of, some people are, it's very intuitive and innate. You don't even know how to conceptualize it into words. You just do it. Right. And so that's great to hear for people because you just need a partner or someone to help you systemize and put it into words and concepts to, so that it can be, it can be scalable or reachable to other people, or even for the audience to understand Correct. what you're doing, Correct. you know, your patients and clients. So yeah, again, if we're talking about business, there, there's two separate things. Number one are your results. Do you need that? Do you need that interpretation for the results? No. Because if you, what you do works, they'll see it. Mm -hmm. That being said, but when you need to communicate it and somebody who's never experienced it and maybe is not, they didn't come referred or maybe like they need to be able to understand the journey you're going to take them on right. and be willing to say, hey, I want to be a part of that journey or yeah. nah, that's not for me, yeah. which is cool, which yeah. is cool. It doesn't have to be like I've had people call me and they're like, oh, um, so do you have this machine? Do you have like this ultrasound thing? Do you have this laser? I'm like, no. I said, oh, because I really wanted to do it. I'm like, but do you want to get rid of the pain or you want to, you would just want to use a laser? I'm like, oh, I want to get rid of pain, but I heard that that's what it is. I said, okay, well, that's why you're coming to me. I can help you get rid of that pain, but I don't need a laser. You know what I'm saying? I don't need this thing. That's yeah. just a tool. I said, would you be okay or would you be open to not using one and still getting the results? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they're like, oh yeah, I just thought that that's how you did it. Other people are like, yeah, but I thought that this is what you need. I said, well, look, the choice is yours. There's plenty of people that use a laser. Have you ever used a laser before? They're like, yeah. And I said, and you still have the pain, right? Yeah, but it was feeling better when I did. I get, I, I get that. Yeah but it didn't heal it because it's a tool. Correct. It's not, it's not the thing. It's a tool that needs to be applied in an overall system to generate the, the end result. An external tool. A lot of right. things that you are, the things that you're talking about have to do with connecting the inside and the inside and the outside, you know? And so right. it, it's a different, uh, I don't want to say it's a different style of healing, but it's a deeper level of healing, you know, and also one that I feel puts the client in charge versus right. dependency on a tool. And so the other thing is there's a lot of people looking for something different. You know, my practice is very integrative also, and people are looking for this stuff. They either have tried the machines and all of that, or the no pain, no gain, or just the physical therapy focused on the physical body, right? And there are people looking for it, but they, so we need to conceptualize it and put it out there so that they can go, this, this sounds much better than the last approach I did where it didn't work. So it's nice because you, you have the people that are looking for it. And then the people that might be open to it and go, I never thought of that. You know, and so I've uh, over the years in my practice, I've learned the, the the results, like you said, speak for itself, and that will get you the business. And that was great for us. Our reputation carries us, but I also realize that there's a lot of people that are looking for something different. And how do they find you? You right. know, so so for people maybe trying to do something different in business, not just physical therapy, you know, I want to share that is that put the effort into creating that message. Don't think of it as like, we, we get caught up and think, oh, it's like marketing or whatever. No, think about the impact, you know, like you're trying to reach these people who are trying to find you. How are they going to find you to approach the seven healths or an integrative approach, holistic approach? in physical therapy or in under any other thing, because there is um, 
with the power of the internet, I find we have a lot of power at our fingertips now, you know, yeah. but we need to, those of us hitting, hidden in the corners and in our four walls, need to put it out on the internet so that people who are trying to look for us can find us. It's very, very valuable. So thank right. you for sharing that. So let's talk about, you have a book called The Legacy Code. Yes. And I would love to hear, you know, how it came about, how, how you ended up writing it, if you want to, uh, if you would share about that. Sure. I, I, um, I actually want to rewind back to kind of the genesis of where it was born before kind of like the process <laughs> of, of the writing of it. And it was like, just imagine if you've ever felt like like something was something was wrong or off but you felt trapped because you didn't feel like you could tell anybody about it let me give you a more concrete example so there was a point in my business uh this was like maybe 8 years ago that i just felt trapped by it. I wanted to help people. I, I hadn't quite figured out the message. I wanted to help them on a deeper level. And all they wanted at the moment was something very superficial. And it was out of integrity with what I wanted to do and how I wanted to help. And I just, I had this, this visceral sensation that I just wanted to burn everything down. I just wanted to start over. I just wanted to leave. And it wasn't because no, like my clients were awesome. But it, this was just like an internal battle that was happening. But yeah. think about this for a second. It's like, who, who am I going to complain to? I had a healthy family. I had a, a nice house. You know, I had cars that worked. You know, it's not, I'm not driving a Ferrari or anything like that. I'm just nice, you know, reliable cars. We're in good health. We could take vacations. From the outside, you know, people would kill to say, oh, wow if I could have that life, mm -hmm. but inside I, I was really conflicted to the point where I was going through a deep depression where mm -hmm. I, I started really pushing away business I, because I just felt so conflicted and it wasn't because we didn't need the money. I was sending the business into bankruptcy. We were in debt mm -hmm. over $160,000 mm -hmm. because of a, of a myriad of things that, 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 spiraled out of control as of, as opposed to the way we were spending the money um, to try to grow the business and it wasn't working. And I just was like at my wit's end. And then that's where, that's where actually where we met a person, right? Or no. Yeah. In Thailand mm -hmm. where I, I spoke with Dax our you know, the coach and he's like, look, I really think this, this program could really help. And I remember being conflicted because we were obviously in debt. Christian, my wife was pregnant with a third one and she had the possibility of having the baby if I did do this because it happened around the similar time of the, of, the, of the retreat. So I would be halfway across the world with a pregnant wife. And she looked at me and I, you know, I share this because it's a really powerful moment in my life where she looked at me and she said, look, do you think this can help you? And I said, yeah, I think it can. And she goes, then you need to do this. Not for you, but for us, because when this baby's born, I need you to be the man, the husband and the father I know you to be. Not, not the way you've been now, because I can't help you. I don't know what to do to help you. And if you feel like this is something that can help, like you need to do this for you and for our family. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, there was a lot of upset people, family, even the doctor was upset with me. She was like, uh, I can't believe you're going to fly across halfway across the world. And I remember Christian told me, she goes, look, I don't want you to miss the birth of our child. But if it happened, I would rather you miss the birth and be in a good place to raise the child than be there for the thing. And then now you be in such a dark place where you're, you're not capable of, of raising this child. And I'm like, okay. So we went over there. I got some clarity. I got some distance. I got some focus. When I came back, 
I started realizing that there was something deeper inside that I, that I constantly kept back to, which was legacy and the importance of that. You know, my oldest is my son. And it was, I kept having this reoccurring thing that said, what do I want him to know about myself? What do I know, want him to know moving forward? If I died today and I had a menu that I could give to him, what would I want for him to be the best man, husband, father that he could be, the best person? And so I started, I set out to start writing that. Over the years, I started like I, the thought process was a seed and then it kind of grew. And in mm -hmm. 2017, this, uh, sorry, December of 2016, I had this epiphany. I'm like, you know what? I should write a book because in 2017, in March, uh, four months later, I was going to be running my first virtual summit. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a summit for men. It was a virtual summit. It was going to go over the course of seven days. And I was like, man, it would be awesome if I had this book written and I could share it with these men and sell it. It would be fantastic. It would be in alignment with the whole gist of the whole summit. And it was the best thing and the worst thing that I could have done. It was the best thing because I was ignorant and it got me to start. Uh -huh. And I started writing and I stopped. Uh -huh. And I just kept having blocks. I kept procrastinating. And I remember in July, after the thing had finished, I said, I was reading a book called, um, what was it called? I think I have it here. Oh, Resisting Happiness. That's what it was. I was, it's on my bookshelf. Um, and I remember it was like in the first seven pages, first three, three to seven pages. And he was talking about, this is an author that uh, Matthew Kelly is a prolific author. And he's like, I've written lots of books and I have, he has his own publishing company at this point. And he's like, I have people come to me all the time and say, I want you to publish my book. And he's like, great. Come to me when you have a manuscript. And he writes, he goes, and I never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's me. I said, I said, that's me, but I don't want that to be me. Mm -hmm. So I, I literally got out $100 from my wallet. I took a picture and I typed in to Facebook. I put this whole post and said, I will give you $100 if in 10 days I do not hand in my first draft to my editor. At the time, I had an editor before Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, you know, I hit sent. I started getting messages. I said, if, if I don't have it by this date, if you comment below, I'm going to send you $100. By the end of the day, I was $9,000 in the hole if I don't follow through which $9,000 that I did not have. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm getting calls from my dad, my <laughs> wife. She's like, what the heck are you doing? Like, I go, it's not going to happen because I'm going to get it done. And <laughs> to make things worse, or as I say, insult to injury, we were going on a vacation. Like we went on vacation like three days later and I didn't put two and two together that I would be in the mountains with no reception during the time that I said that I would hand it in. But you know what? I said, I'm going to do this. And I would wake up at three or four in the morning. I would start typing until everybody would wake up. I would go through the day. And then I would go in the afternoon when everybody was sleeping at a night, mm -hmm. I would write some more. And with two days to spare, I finished. And wow. I said, okay. And I drove down from the mountains into town to get reception, sent in the draft and came back making sure that I did not have to pay $9,000 to <laughs> send out $9,000. Amazing. So that was kind of like the story behind the story yeah. of the book itself. Yeah. Wow. That was great. I'm so happy you shared like very transparent. Thank you for being that, uh, sharing that whole journey because the people who there's a lot of everyday people like us who have this inner inspiration to write a book and we all struggle with it and uh just kind of hearing like amazing how you wrote it in eight days you know um and the and the and the struggles you had with it so i'm sure that will be helpful well, hold on i i finished it in eight days. i had stuff already started yeah and and by the way that was draft one of 14 so yes. it wasn't done 
it was just the first draft was handed in and then they're like oh we need to add a story here we need to move this here we need to you know like hey i need you to expand on this and so then it started growing from there yes tell me about you mentioned i had an editor before christian became my editor so tell me about that because christian's your wife who right. is not in book writing <laughs> yeah what 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 happened was that I went into this thinking like I don't want to add more stuff to to Christian's plate. I didn't even have her read it for the first five. I think it was the first five or six drafts. Um, and then one day she's like, "But like I want to be a part of it. Like I want I like I want to read this. I like this is important to you. This is important to me." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, I didn't I didn't want to burden you with more things." And she goes, "No, like I like I want to help." Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And then the editor I had was, was great. She was awesome, but she didn't know me like Christian knows me. And Christian also has this gift of being like a natural editor. Mm-hmm. And then when she would read what I wrote, she's like, okay, I know what you're trying to say, but you're not saying it. And then she would like retype it. And she's like, look, I think this is what you're trying to say. I was like, oh Yeah. You said yeah. it better than I than I would have said it, right? So then yeah. she would have kind of like help rewrite and kind of re restructure the way things were, mm-hmm. and there was a point where I was like, okay, look, I, let me just focus on Christian, you know, and then you know help financially. Like I didn't have to keep paying this other editor, um, which again, not that she wasn't worth it, but there was only so much from that perspective that she could take because she didn't she can give me like what's on there. Hey, I didn't like the way this was said. Not, Hey, I don't think this is what you were trying to say because I I've had enough conversations with you and we've had this conversation that what you've said in those conversations is actually not coming out here. And I know that that's your intention. Yeah. So definitely some value richness to someone who is comfortable with editing and grammar and also is very close to you and knows you, right? Like your right. our significant other can finish our thoughts. So it's like, there's so much value to that. And just to see how it, you know, your relationships keep, your relationship keeps discovering a different way to like work together, like your talents yeah. and your skills in the, in the business and then now the book. And so that's, it's such a beautiful journey within the journey. Yeah. I, by the way, and again, I don't want to make it sound like it was all, you know, roses and fairies. It was actually very difficult for me because, you know, I'm presenting this work, which I already know is not perfect. Uh-huh. And then I have the person I care about the most critiquing it. <laughs> and so probably the first three or four drafts that she gave me was very, very difficult, like to the point where it was um, was like... Um, combative (laughs) partly because I felt like I was being attacked when in reality she was just doing what what the editor was doing except it was my wife Wife. and and until I let that my ego go and let like that awareness of saying okay wait wait she's here to make this better and she's not saying it in a bad way or anything like that I'm just I'm taking it like oh how could she say that? You know, like in my mind, mm-hmm. like this drama would build up and then I would get passive aggressive. And then I would be like, and then I realized one day I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Like, yeah. She's making it better. Like, this is why it's like, oh, then we became a team. Oh yeah. Let's, mm-hmm. let's add this, 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 and this. Oh, yes. let's do, do this. So again, I don't want to make it seem like I'm perfect and things were all roses and my wife and I, we never right. argued about it. No, like there was struggle. There was friction. Yeah. But I think that's why at the end it came out better mm-hmm. um, because I, I think yeah. one can feel like that process in, in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing about that. So now your book is out. It's been a few years. What was your notion? You know, uh, people usually are like, I'm going to have, I want to sell lots of books. I'm going to go on shows and this and that. Right. And so will you share with us like what has happened since the book has been out and uh, you know, what fulfillment you got from it? Yeah. So in my mind, uh, so 
there were there were two things. Like I said, if I had this manual and only my son, and my my kids, but at the time my my son was the oldest one to to read. Uh huh. Um, like if they were able to get it and at least have a manual for life, I felt like that took top 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 mm-hmm. priority. From a business perspective, I was in my mind imagining, hey, I'm going to do this. I be- if, if it becomes a bestseller, then I'll be able to get on shows and then I'll be booked for speaking gigs and then I'll you know, get a lot more clients. I, I'm not saying that can't happen. I'm saying it didn't happen at least the way I envisioned. Mm-hmm. So I got a good chunk of change. You know, it became a bestseller. Amazing. Like, yes like I'm more this you're coming from I, I almost failed English like I had a teacher that was like like you suck <laughs> essentially <laughs> it was not a great relationship uh-huh. um, but to think that I could write a book that can mm-hmm. become a bestseller was was really like rewarding mm-hmm. then on top of that it was like okay I didn't really have a bigger picture of how to go about this I've never done this I never mm-hmm. so I, I think the vision when you write a book is write the book and expect that the book will be your life for five years, like a good five year chunk. Mm-hmm. And then after that, you can kind of shift the narrative of the next thing that you want to write or talk about. And I didn't think about it. I was like, oh, you know, within the year, I was like, oh, I got a million other things I got to talk about. So I started going. So the book kind of fell by the wayside. It's still there on Amazon. People still purchase it, um, which I'm very grateful. Um, it is something that sometimes I'll send out to people. It is something that, um, you know, it definitely adds credibility when somebody says, oh, you know, you're a published author. That's amazing. But I, I think what I didn't realize that would affect me the most was when my son read it the first time. And I say the first time because he's read it at least three times cover to cover. Wow. He, I have three. He's the only one that's read it so far but he's read it three times. And like the first time he read it, I was like, oh, that's, that's why I wrote it. Like to me, that was it. Mm-hmm. Like after that, I was like, oh, that's why I wrote it. Mm-hmm. The fact that he read it and I wasn't sure. I mean, at the time, it's 2000 and I said 2017, the book didn't come in until January of 2018. So we're into that. So four years, four years ago. When the book came out, my son was nine, mm-hmm. and he read it cover to cover. Read it? That's when he read it. Nine? Wow. He's a, he's a really good reader. He's advanced, uh-huh. but but you know. still, yeah. <laughs> that's a yeah. book written for adults. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fact that he he took the time to read it, yeah, was really impactful for me because I was like, oh, you know, he's still young. Like it's not, it's just not uh and he likes to, again. He likes to read, but I again, I didn't think that he willingly asked he asked you can I read the book right yeah and I was like yeah of course yeah so yeah so what I want to highlight is that you know the fulfillment you got you know when we are approaching something to do achievement and success and we we have a painting in our in our mind of what it looks like maybe because of what people have said you write a book and you do this and this these things happen but honestly like if I ask you would you rather be on the greatest biggest talk show show on the in the world about your book or have your son willingly read your book which one would you pick Uh, number two for sure number two for sure that's why I'm here I'm here to make sure that my kids become the best versions of themselves you know, yeah. that they are contributing members of the society, that they make an impact in this world. The greatest impact I can make is raising the best kids that I can make, mm-hmm. right? We took the time to make them. Let's make them the best that they can be. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love that. That should be your, one of your t-shirts or something. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for sharing um, about that. So Let's talk about some of the recent things you're doing. Um, you 
are, well, tell me some of the new things that you're trying, whichever you want to <laughs> talk about. <laughs> Oh man, it's funny because my wife is like, I've never met anybody who has so many hobbies, so many things. It's like that's how I grow, that's how I explore. Like that's how yeah. I need that that stimulation. You drive your wife crazy, and I could see that, you know, as a spouse, because like I'm very also have a gazillion things that I want to do or want do, but yeah. on the outside, like I'm an outsider when I see all the things that you're always trying and playing with and like what is he doing and it's so mm -hmm. inspiring it's so, like i remember and i don't know if you do them anymore because i haven't po you've seen posts but watermelon birthday cakes yeah. <laughs> i used to be so fascinated i'm like how did they do that and just like the fact that the kids were getting watermelon birthday cakes you know and it was just yeah. just all the things it's just so inspiring because it's so out of the box and creative you know, and it's so, you know, that's how the rest of us feel that aren't married to you or in your house. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, from, this... from, the, from the outside, it probably seems better than on the inside because it's like, oh, you're doing something else again. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That's how creatives are, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, look, look, you, you brought up the watermelon birthday cakes. The, the watermelon birthday cakes really stem from, we didn't want the kids to, to be eating sugar and a whole bunch of that that junk so mm -hmm. i was like you know what i'll i'll make i'll take a watermelon when we say birthday cake what i mean it's it's literally a watermelon that i've carved in, into something and the kids eat it yes and so the first one would look pretty sucky and then i got better because i did it more i started having more kids and then i had you know my nephews is like hey can you make one for my for my son and what was interesting is that at the beginning like the the my aunts and people were like oh but you're gonna deprive the kids yeah. like deprive them of what of cake no like he has a cake like, yeah. yeah yeah but but he's gonna be he's gonna be abnormal because <laughs> he doesn't have a, a cake and I go what's interesting is that everybody goes to a party and then they're like feel bad about eating the cake because they shouldn't be eating the cake and it's like you know what happens there was no watermelon left because everybody ate it all and you know what? Nobody felt guilty about it. Yeah. They enjoyed it. They ate it. They loved it. Yeah. And the kids would have asked for it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, as they've gotten older, like my daughter asked for other cakes as well. But if I asked her, so you want to make your watermelon cake? Sometimes she'll say, yeah. Sometimes she'll say, no. Uh -huh. It's a lot of work for me. Uh -huh. But if they say yes, now it's like, okay, great. And there's a, we found the other alternatives, you know, yeah. raw fruit pies that we make that, that are like cake. So there's other options you know alternatives that we can buy that i don't have to spend you know several uh -huh. hours doing but at the end of the day like they have their their cake their memory of it and and everyone feels good about it mm -hmm. um you asked what else you know there was a you mentioned about the haikus mm -hmm. I, I didn't I, I never wrote any poetry i was never any good at it when we tried it in school mm -hmm. and then maybe three, two, two and a half years ago, maybe. Tell us what a haiku is. So haiku is a Japanese form of, of uh, poetry that has five, has three lines and it has five syllables on the first line, seven syllables on the second, and then five syllables. So it's five, seven, five. In Japanese culture, it's usually about nature. But mm -hmm. right from the beginning, I played with nature, which I really like. But I've also played with other things. And when I did it for the first year and a half, I did it with whatever inspired me in that day. What I started doing this year, um, it kind of goes back to not always the things are going to be enjoyable. I started going to dictionary.com and there's a word of the day. And the, let me tell you, it has not been enjoyable. <laughs> it, it's been very difficult. I fight with it all the time. Um, but I committed to doing it for two reasons. Number one, help me improve my vocabulary. And then goes back to, because the resistance is there, it's forcing me to think in different ways. And some of them are like, oh. and some of them are like, man, this haiku sucked, but it's what I got. This is what I got for today. This is what I got for this word. Mm -hmm. This word was ridiculous. And some of them are like, okay, well, you know, there's some words, there's some, there's some words that have been like six syllables. Well, 
okay, well, I can't put it on the first line. I can't put it on the second, on the, on the last line. So automatically that one goes in the middle. So now you start working this puzzle. Uh -huh. And then sometimes you work like, so it's gotten me to think in different ways. And at the end of the year, I don't want to continue to like, I know that for a fact, I don't want to continue that. Like uh -huh. I can do that if I wanted to on, on a day that I can't think of a word or something like that, but having a word and then having you have to create the puzzle around it or solve the puzzle to create the haiku is kind of stretching my imagination. It's stretching my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. It's stretching different angles so mm -hmm. now i write the the definition of the word and it's like oh okay so do i take on the definition directly or do mm -hmm. i take it on indirectly so directly it's like oh it's the direct meaning of the word or it's like oh is there is there something that i can use that is like an analogy towards it mm -hmm. um i'm trying to think of an example but i can't think of one right now but like if if there was a word that that meant um you know giving hugs mm -hmm. could i use it instead of a person giving a hug like can i use it like light hugging you right like so mm -hmm. it's still the definition but now i'm i'm tying it into something different and so again it just stretches you yeah and now you got to look at it and i look at it as kind of like a problem that i got to solve yeah. because this word is new to me it's yeah. foreign and some of them are like ridiculous yeah. So um, that's one, one extreme, but what's interesting is that most of my life I've been pretty in the middle. I'm pretty level-headed. You know, my dad always taught me like, Hey, you know, don't, don't go too much this way. Don't go too much that way. It's like, Hey, be even keel. People can depend on you. People, you know, like getting blowing up and being angry is you're not going to solve the problem there. In fact, it's going to create more resistance. So like, why escalate things uh -huh. like find other ways to communicate and and to debate that uh -huh. so I, I spent a lot of my time like that and what happened is I felt you know I'm 42 I have three kids a wife and it's like I got to this point this past year where I was like you know I, there's there's a violent side there's a savage side that has been atrophied for years and it, and it became very important because I was, I was playing with the poet and I wanted to see what's on the other side. And it's not that I desire to be violent towards people, but as a man, it's important to have the ability to access that should I ever need it. And I hope I never. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm playing with these two worlds where I'm, I took on jujitsu with my my youngest because mm -hmm. he's very physical and i was like oh this would be a great thing and then we get to do it together yeah. and so we're learning and growing in that in that capacity so now i'm finding myself in this journey between the poet and the savage and it's kind of like okay wow. how do we how do how do we how do we explore this how do we we play with this a little bit more to help me grow to be a better man husband father yes. and to feel more capable in yeah. some respects that I felt had been atrophied over the year. I'm a runner, right? So like I literally would run away from problems. Like that was my way of, of dealing with it. Uh -huh. And now it's not that I'm here to fight through the problem, but again, should the problem, and I'm, I quickly realized on the first class that when I was there and I was like, oh, you know, I'm in great shape. Yeah. And the shape wasn't the problem. It was like, I couldn't do anything. The guy had me completely trapped. He was choking me. He was doing this. I'm like, <laughs> fascinating. So I right? felt helpless. Yes. Yes. And I really believe that there's some power and energy when you say atrophy, I can feel it, you know? Yeah. And I really believe that we should follow the things that we want that's pulling us, you know, and and I hear it's not about the violence and all of that, but there's something behind the atrophy, something that's in you that wants to awaken, awaken or get some attention or, right. you know, get some action in real life. Right. And so that's really cool. And uh, just like how you just shared, you were in a chokehold and you didn't know what to do. You couldn't do anything. Like it was like, a mindset of something is there that's wanting to connect with 
this other side that has gotten so much attention, right? So it's, it's and just that you are owner of a company that promotes seven healths. And I find this mm -hmm. to be very healthy, what you're doing of like <laughs> exploring and your whole being. And uh, I just think that's very important. So yeah, that's great. And I'm happy you shared about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me share about it. Yes. So uh, before we wrap up, I want to ask you, what advice would you give to people who are watching this, who, um, who are doing something different or just, you know, what generally um, in, from your experiences of where you've been, what kind of knowledge and wisdom would you depart? All right, so let, let, me, let me break this down in two ways. Number one, if you're already doing something different, number one, amazing. Like, let me honor you. Let me congratulate you because it is difficult to do something out of the norm. Um, the other thing is I want to encourage you to not get disappointed if things don't go the way you want. Be willing, like you did something different because for some reason, like, is that reason strong enough for you to go and take the bumps and bruises? Because again, it's not always, it's not everyone is built for the bumps and bruises. And maybe the why isn't strong enough. Maybe you thought it was a good idea, but uh, maybe you don't feel like it was that great of an idea. But if it's something that you're like, no, I felt like this was my mission. Okay, then be what, like, if you felt like this was your mission and that's why you're doing things different, then be willing to take those bumps and bruises. I guarantee you on the other side of that, it'll be worth it. If you just thought, oh, maybe it was a good idea. I can make money like this, you know, just take capitalizing on this. Eh, maybe, yeah, maybe, you know, like, I don't know if that really lights you up. Mm -hmm. If it does, then explore it. But if it doesn't really light you up, then maybe it's not for you at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. yep. But if you're on the fence where you kind of feel trapped, if you kind of feel like, man, I, I don't want to be part of the machine, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I want to step away. I don't want to just be one of the cogs. I want to step out and do something different. I want, there's, there's a mission that's deeper that I want to drive. I would say, be willing to take that first step. Stay curious, surround yourself with people who have done it. Surround yourself with people who will encourage you to take that first step. That first step is one of the most difficult ones you will take. But I guarantee you that the second you take that first step, you're gonna take a huge deep breath and you're gonna be like, wow, freedom. That doesn't mean easy. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful. It just means, oh, I just stepped out on my own. Mm -hmm. And that is a powerful, powerful, powerful um, experience to have that most people just stay in the same loop, stay in the same loop. And you've had the courage to step out. So I would say, be courageous to step out. Surround yourself with people that will encourage you and can teach you how to continue to move forward and remember why you did it in the first place. Like, what is your mission behind that? Like, why are you doing this? Why is it important to you? Because if you can do that, you can endure the bumps and bruises. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was so, so hot from the heart. I appreciate it so much. So uh, thank you for being here and you guys can Check out Armando's book, uh, The Legacy Code on Amazon.com. You want to put in Legacy Code, Armando Cruz, and it'll take you right to the book. And if you want to learn more about his uh, healthy approach to uh, physical therapy and health, uh, you can check out Cruz Country, C R U Z Country.com. And uh, thank you, Armando, for being so transparent, uh, granting this time of abundance with me and our audience and just sharing all the beautiful things about your life. And, you know, this will help people see um, that there is lots of richness and value in the things that we want to follow and create and that success and fulfillment can be uh, it can be in very many different ways and pathways and it can look different and just sharing the journey too, because the journey is where people struggle and then they give up 
and you know sharing stories like you're outside of the walls will show people that there are people who are making it and doing it and how do they do it and we all struggle it's just right. our perspective and how good we get at it as we like the watermelon you were doing you know <laughs> um and also i want to add if i may uh for you can find armando on facebook is that okay to share yep. he shares his haikus on there he share every all of the little some of the little projects he does he posts on there haikus are on there and i now you put the the meaning in there and i try to memorize it and then i go okay i'm going to use this today and then i don't mm -hmm. but you know what it's ha it is happening is like i'm tying the word to the picture lately mm -hmm. so there was okay maybe i remember one in amorata uh -huh. is it right yeah. in amorata because it was a picture of you and christian and it right. means something a, wo a woman who is loved a woman, a woman who is loved yes yeah. and so i i was like oh that's nice and i never got it i never got to use it but i remember it and the flag mm -hmm. one I, I was like so i've been starting to get you know um it's a nice way to even like use your haikus as a dictionary if i want to go mm -hmm. so you can connect <laughs> with him on facebook and um continue to be in that creative and energy and his presence um so thank you armando for being here and i will speak to you soon Take care. Take care. Bye.